there. Great to see you. My name is Julie Hirschberg. I am a neurologic physical therapist and the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness here in the Los Angeles area. And very excited to chat with you tonight um, with some of the recent literature that I've been looking at. And I have to give a big shout out to my colleague and um, great therapist here at Reactive, which is Brittany Kim, because she really is the one that hooked me into graded motor imagery. And I've since been learning about it a lot, um, basically since meeting Brittany. <laughs> um, but I am preparing for a course that I'm presenting at our national conference in February on functional neurologic disorders. And today, as I was um, putting together some of the slides and putting the one on graded motor imagery, I was like, I, I found some new literature and of course have to share it with you. So I wanted to share an article and a little bit of background on graded motor imagery. So let me start with what is graded motor imagery. If you are a therapist who's been in this the world of kind of orthopedics and neurology, you probably have heard of this. This is one of the slides we use a lot in talking about the step-by-step -step of graded motor imagery. And this is a, um, uh, I guess, a, a treatment technique, for lack of a better word, um, that was developed to help with chronic pain. And it has been very, very effective, and it's been around for a long time. Now, it has since been shown to be very effective in other neurologic disorders, um, stroke, brain injury, for example, um, and in CRPS and functional neurologic disorders is what we've been finding um, quite a bit at Reactive. And this, the um, research that I want to show you tonight actually is, um, is in CRPS, uh, which is a functional neurologic disorder, um, one of the types of that. So I'm going to talk about that. But first, let me just orient you to this. If you're not familiar with graded motor imagery, so um, graded motor imagery is a four-step process. Um, well, and I should say really ends in this graded exposure to uh, a functional activity, um, but starts with right-left discrimination. So we're really looking at a sensory perceptual experience. The second step is imagining movement. And we know there is a lot out there in um, from a research standpoint on mental imagery and how powerful it is in changing someone's movement capabilities. So right-left discrimination, so a sensory perceptual type training. The second piece is imagined movements. The third is mirror therapy. So most people who have heard of mirror therapy have heard it in the context of maybe somebody post-stroke, um, maybe somebody with an amputation, um, but the applications again are limitless. We use a lot of mirror therapy at Reactive because it has really fantastic ways of changing the brain. And again, when we're looking at therapy, we want to change the brain. Um, so mirror therapy is one of those ways. And then that leads to graded exposure. So particularly when we're talking about um, a neurologic injury where the person may have abnormal sensations or abnormal motor control is we use this process to build up that person's nervous system capacity for different sensory experiences, for different motor experiences, particularly when it comes um, to uh, abnormal sensations um, that a person might have. So that's that's the, the kind of quick and dirty um, graded motor imagery to graded exposure progression. Not everybody goes in order, by the way. Not everybody needs to do laterality or right-left discrimination training um, if they don't have a deficit in that. You don't train it if you don't have a deficit. Um, some people do really well with mental imagery and imagine movements and other people it can actually make symptoms worse. And so just like with all things, it's quite individualized. It's not a cookie cutter approach for people. But I wanted to get that background so that I could talk about 
this study. So let me bring up this study here. This is um, a study from uh, in a in a peer reviewed research journal called Brain Communications. It's a sister journal of Brain, um, which is a well renowned journal, and it is called Graded Motor Imagery Modifies Movement Pain cortical excitability and sensory motor function in complex regional pain syndrome. So there's a lot in this study. And honestly, I, I would have to chat with you for the next two hours to talk through all of it. Um, because it's actually when we talk about transmagnetic stimulation, they're using it as an assessment piece in here. It gets really complicated. And honestly, I don't always understand all of it. So I'm going to go over some of the key pieces from this article uh, with you. Um, but, but bottom line, what I love about this is that they looked at the intervention, not just for improving somebody's pain and function, they looked at it changing the brain through um, transmagnetic stimulation as an assessment and through functional MRI. Not a lot of studies do this. And so I think this is really, really powerful. So let's take a look here. Um, and I'll, um, I'll show you this study design. It's nice. They actually put together a visual of the study design. So they had 21 people, I believe. Let me pull up my notes here. 21 people, um, actually initially 26 people with CRPS, but this study was conducted then when COVID started. And so um, they ended up with 21 people and they did a crossover design, a wait list design. So um, some folks waited to do the protocol and so that they could compare them um, during that waiting period. So you can see um, these two groups, the, the first group at the top here, they did their pre-test measuring, then they waited, then they did their post-test, and then they did the graded motor imagery protocol for six weeks, and then they did another post-test. The other group, so down at the bottom, they did their pre-test, then they did six weeks of graded motor imagery, then they did the post-test, and then they waited, and then they did the second post-test. Um, so some of the things they tested, for example, were pain, they did um, uh, fine um, motor, these were all people with hand CRPS, by the way, um, they did some motor tasks, and then they used the fMRI and the transmagnetic stimulation to actually look at changes in the brain. How cool is that? Because we know with functional neurologic disorders and a disorder like CRPS, part of the pathophysiology is that there are brain changes, changes in um, sensory cortex size and hand representation, for example, if there's CRPS of the hand. So what they did is they actually looked to see if that changed over time. So I want to share with you some of the findings and um, I've got another picture here. So let me grab this. Let's see, I think right here. Oh, and it's tiny, <laughs> it's totally tiny. So let me talk you through um, what they have here are pre and post scores. And then you see the little asterisks at the top if those are significant. The first one is pain level. So you can see pre and post, you can see that the pain decreased. The second one is the rotor, which was um, a, a test of hand function. And you can see that from pre to post, that also lower score means, means less impaired. So that improved. The third one, um, which is the let me get this one correct, um, is a measure of their um, activation. Actually, let me go to the fourth one. It's the SICI. That's the short intracortical inhibition, um, which is looking at what they did with the transmagnetic stimulation. And you can see that that really significantly changed from pre to post. And then finally, the last one is the fMRI. 
So the fMRI, this is S1, the primary somatosensory cortex, that, that changed also uh, very significantly from pre to post. So significant findings all around here. So I want to read some of these pieces because I, I found this very interesting and, and we can stop. Um, well, actually, I'll just pull this up again here so you can see this. And and again, I put all of the links to the articles. This one's a free full text article. I'll put it in the newsletter this week. So if you haven't joined our newsletter, you can join it. Um, if you're a person with neurologic disorders at reactivept.com, if you're a healthcare provider at reactiveeducation.com. This is um, this is what they found at baseline first. So this is so interesting. During baseline testing, they test this short intracortical inhibition. So again, this is the transmagnetic stimulation. And they found that this was decreased only for the affected hand because they compared side to side. So we see this inhibition has decreased and that really makes sense when we think of a lot of functional neurologic disorders but especially crps and some of the sensory and autonomic pieces that occur may be occurring because there's less inhibition that is displayed so that was the number one thing what is really interesting then is that they found then after graded motor imagery that improved. So the inhibition improved. And in this case, we, we want more inhibition um, because we want a more modulated sensory experience for a person. Okay, number two, this is the functional MRI. So what they did is actually had the person move like a, like a hand grasp uh, with their more affected limb and what they found was the hand representation area side, but sorry, the hand representation area in the primary somatosensory cortex was smaller in people that had CRPS for a longer duration. That makes sense because when you have CRPS of the hands, um, just like many other neurologic disorders, you don't use it as much. So it makes sense that it would have less um, area a less map in the sensory cortex and what they found with graded motor imagery is that area increased so graded motor imagery increased the sensory map of the hand and this is precisely what we're trying to do in many neurologic disorders is improve somebody's ability to have uh, better sensory discrimination, but have a proper map of that limb or part of the limb. So that was number two. Um, and then let's see, there was one other piece. Oh, another really interesting thing here is as that person, the these were correlated. So the neurophysiologic parameters of the TMS and the fMRI were actually correlated to the person's improvement in pain and their improvement in function. None of these changes occurred when the person was in the waiting period when they didn't have therapy. So they are really saying that, gosh, this doesn't just happen over time, but this happens with this particular intervention of graded motor imagery. Now, what I think is so interesting is it's very rare that clinically we just do graded motor imagery. It, that's just rare. Like as clinicians, we incorporate graded motor imagery with motor control training and sensory discrimination training and autonomic training and lifestyle interventions. Um, maybe even just strengthening, they did not. So, and that's very common, right? In a research study, they're just going to control one variable and that's graded motor imagery. And in this study, which by the way, was um, out of uh, Germany um, and Boston and Australia, pretty cool. Um, 
they found that just doing the graded motor imagery was helpful for folks. Not only helpful, but it changed their brain. So they got less pain, better function, changed their brain, changed their sensory map, changed the excitability in their cortex. All very positive findings. Now, just imagine then that you had this and all of those other pieces, all of those other pieces of the pie that we often talk about. Um, imagine having all of those. Um, then I think instead of just seeing, so let me just go back to the results here. We see some improvement in pain. We see a pretty good improvement in that person's function. If I would argue if that person actually had like that full complete care, not just graded motor imagery, you would see that um, pain number probably go down to zero or one and that function return. Um, you know, we see people with hand CRPS return to full function of using their hands. And we see people with CRPS of their foot return to full use of their foot, running, jumping, all of all of those things. So I think graded motor imagery is one part of, of that. Um, and I actually think, um, I'm gonna go back to the graded motor imagery picture here. I actually think this is a missing piece for many people in other neurologic disorders. I think people do this really well in, in persistent pain, maybe even in CRPS. You definitely should be. The literature is there. It's very clear. But I don't think we do this enough in functional neurologic disorders. Um, and this is a very big piece of, of returning somebody to function. Amy says, yes. You know what, Amy, your, your name up there made me think not just functional neurologic disorders, um, but other, other disorders or comorbid conditions. I'm thinking particularly um, because I know Amy has been a big part of a team working on a case where somebody has EDS and POTS and MCAS and is returning to um, their life slowly but surely. But this process of graded motor imagery to graded exposure is very applicable to so many health conditions and we're underutilizing it. So that was, that is really my uh, take home. Great study, great results in CRPS. Let's think about this and apply it. There's great principles here for many disorders, but but most definitely do not leave this out of functional neurologic disorders. You don't want to leave this out of other neurologic disorders in general. Consider using graded motor imagery. It's a hidden gem. I would say it's primarily been living in the orthopedic world and we need to marry that. It's, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a neurologic intervention, right? So uh, let's bring that into the neuro world and apply it to our cases. Clinically, we are seeing a really great um, response with people with functional neurologic disorders in incorporating mo graded motor imagery into their motor control training. Again, it's not for everybody and it's not a cookie cutter. It's not everybody gets six weeks of GMI. No, that's not how it works. But take what we know and incorporate it for the person that needs it. Absolutely, 100% yes. So um, again, let me just pull up um, the name of the article. And if you are um, not on our newsletter, please grab our get on our newsletter every Friday. I'll send out these videos, the articles, links. This one's free, full text. Um, and you can sign up at reactiveeducation.com if you are a healthcare provider or reactivept.com if you're a person with neurologic disorder. I send out a Friday newsletter. I send out a Monday newsletter and I'll include all of this great information and I'll keep sharing what I'm learning and doing. And thanks so much for your curiosity and caring about this um, just as much and showing up. So thanks again. Really appreciate you. I hope you have a great evening. Good night.